PhD interviews are absolutely daunting, but imagine you've got to give a five minute presentation. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm your man, I've got you, we've got this. Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Samuel Dada and I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Chemistry. Welcome back to my channel. Um, if you're new, welcome to my channel. Um, if you've been here before, um, hello and welcome back. Um, yeah, so guys, I'm here with a new video on kind of like a tips and advice kind of video. Um, this is one I've had on my list for a long time and I've been willing, I've been kind of anticipating doing it but I wasn't really sure how to really go about making this video or how to kind of deliver this video in the way I would like you guys to kind of absorb the information. Uh, but yeah, I'm just gonna go with the flow and hopefully it works out in the way I want it to work out. Um, but guys, yeah, this is a video kind of giving you a guide or like an advice on how to like, you know, give a five minute presentation uh, for a PhD interview. So some PhD interviews actually require you to give like a five or 10 minute presentation on a research topic um, that you're either interested in or research area that maybe or topic or project that you have been involved in previously um, so this is kind of your chance to kind of like show off what you have and what you got and what kind of interests you in a way and just kind of deliver maybe in a way your presentation skills on and kind of a way of actually showing how you kind of cope under pressure because you know going to a PhD interview is a high stress environment and being able to compose yourself and deliver an information whether it's a scientific information or whatever it may be in a kind of composed manner um, kind of says a lot about you as a person um, I mean I had to do this quite a few times and I know a lot of my interviews, PhD interviews required me to give a five minute presentation as well as um, kind of give a review on like a paper um, but usually typically um, five minute presentations are quite normal. Um, so um, I remember when I did this um, obviously I had just completed my master's degree so I decided um, to kind of home in and focus on um, my master's project um, because I felt like it was more relevant at the time and that was something I just finished and I thought well I'll be able to deliver the information the, in the best way I can um, based on the fact that I just finished, I had my vibe, I had written the whole report so I kind of picked something I thought I was confident in at the moment and I just wanted to like talk about that um, so I kind of focused on my master's project and um, Usually with those kind of presentations, I think it's very important for you to be very concise in the information that you give and you need to be very kind of straight to the point direct because five minutes, it's not a lot. It flies by and especially if you've been involved in like a huge project or you know, like your project pretty much takes maybe like, for example, a range of maybe eight weeks um, if you're doing a master's or um, maybe um, an undergraduate project to maybe a whole year um, so it's actually quite a lot that you get to do you troubleshoot you do you know a lot of experiments so actually trimming that down to like a five minute talk is very very difficult so it's very important that you focus on the key information you need to ask yourself what is the key information I want these um, panelists to gain out of the talk I'm giving um, the way I tend to structure it, especially for a five minute presentation, I think you should have no more than five slides, so essentially one minute per slide. Um, and I tend to kind of focus on, okay, give a brief introduction on kind of the significance and the importance of your research, um, essentially, um, and then go into maybe what your aims are, and then maybe go into um, kind of um, your methodology and then go into your results and kind of maybe future summary or what could be do done next. So I feel like you should just break it down in that way. But always ask yourself when you're making these slides, like, okay, what is the key information I want them to gain out of this slide specifically? And then that's what you sh I feel like you should kind of do with every slide you make. What is the key 
information what is the key take-home message you want them to gain out of this slide so for example your introduction what is the key what is the significance of your research your aims what are you essentially doing um, your methodology why have you done this why is this method important uh, your results what are your key findings and maybe your conclusion what do you think needs to be done next um, kind of thing um, so I that's the way I think that it should be broken down um, because that's the way um, I feel like they'll be able to digest the information a lot better um, I mean it's a daunting process don't get me wrong I remember giving my presentation um, at Imperial interview and it was a front of about 15 PIs and literally my leg was literally shaking I was standing and my leg was like literally shaking I was like oh my god what am I gonna do blah 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 but actually I do believe that the presentation aspect of it is actually a very good icebreaker um, because sometimes when you go to an interview that doesn't have that presentation element you don't know where to start from in terms of the conversations you're gonna have in terms of you know um, leading questions and certain things like that it's, it's kind of a bit odd and also it, you have a guide you have a prompt to kind of show people this is your opportunity to have something that you have there to use as an aid to explain certain things when they're asking you questions um, whereas if you just have a sit-down interview you don't have that opportunity you kind of have to kind of go in deep with yourself and try and explain things you know verbally and orally in a very you know detailed manner, manner for them to understand what you're saying without actually having a prompt to kind of guide you and show what has happened or what are you what your results are or what the significance of your project is um, so when you're making a slide I am very like in terms of slides I am of the opinion that slides should be very minimal in text I really hate heavy texted slides um, I think graphical slides to me in my own opinion I don't know if I'm right or wrong but this is just my own preference and my own opinion I feel like graphical slides are a lot better um, because you have kind of a visual aid to help people people if they're if you're explaining things and you're talking through things and you have loads of text there they focus and read that text rather than actually looking and listening to you whereas a graphical you know kind of slides kind of shows them okay this is a general aspect of what you're doing but they're actually absorbing what you're saying rather than concentrating and reading what is going on in the slide um, and that's the reason why you know you know graphs and data are really good because it's like a first glimpse you can see a trend straight away but if you write oh um, that um, treatment had a higher blah 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 than that treatment they're not listening to you but if you have a visual you know result you can see it straight away in the graphs, you can see the significance straight away that oh, the treatment had the better maybe survival rate than the non-treated, you know? So I, I just feel like graphical aid is so important and this is the reason why, like I say, I do kind of like the kind of five minute presentation element of um, the PhD interview. But anyway guys, um, so like I said, um, in terms of how I was going to kind of structure um, this um, video, I thought it would be quite nice um, for me to actually give a presentation. So my master's, so actually a presentation I gave during my interview, um, which was on my master's project. Um, so I thought, what better way to do that than to show you guys. I know some of you guys have actually requested um, for my presentation and I've given access to it. So any one of you, who, if you need access to this presentation, um, just click on, I'll put the link below anyway um, on the Google Docs Drive. Um, so yeah, you can request for access and I'll give you permission to have access um, to the slides. But yeah guys, I'm going to be basically giving you a presentation. Please don't be too harsh on me because um, I haven't relived or done this project in such a long time. I mean, this was in 2017 when I started this project. I mean, we're in 2020. It was a long time ago um, and I've done so many other things and other projects since then. But I am trying to go back in time and kind of give you a nice kind of what a presentation should look like. Um, yeah, so don't judge me if all the information is not fully correct. Um, but I feel like I'm able to actually regurgitate what I did. Um, and I've been looking at kind of my slides and I kind of still remember 
what that project was all about and what my significant findings was about so i hope yeah you enjoy this video and you know what let's turn into interview mode let's go hello everyone so i'm going to be giving a presentation on my masters of research project um, so essentially my master's research project was aimed to kind of investigate how microbial vitamin B6 regulates host physiology in a C. elegans um, E. coli hollow biot model. Um, this model essentially depicts um, the three-way interaction between nutrients, microbes and hosts. And understanding these interactions with relation to vitamin B6 um, specifically or B6 deficiency is of biological and social um, importance because the prevalence of pathology resulting from singular or subclinical vitamin deficiencies are kind of heightened um, in um, less economically developed countries um, as a result of lack of um, dietary diversification or um, ins insufficient um, food supplies. Whereas in the West or kind of richer, wealthier nations, it's kind of um, results from the high-fat Western diet. Um, however, these kind of vitamins are kind of known to, um, or for known to explicitly act as like cofactors and coenzymes for various metabolic reactions. However, it's important to kind of note that um, we as humans do not actually possess the cellular machinery to kind of synthesize um, these vitamins. Therefore, we must sequester these vitamins in adequate amount. For, like through our diet, for example, um, as shown kind of there. Um, however, although diet is the primary source of vitamin B6 um, um, or vitamins in general, microbes within our large intestines has been suggested to contribute to the total vitamin B6 pool within our body. This kind of leads us to kind of the importance of this study between of the interaction between nutrients, microbes, and the host, in which we kind of collectively as shown here, called the holobiot model. In our model, vitamin B6, as you know already, is our nutrients, um, um, in which um, our nutrients and our microbe is the E. coli, in which our host, the elegans, um, kind of eats and feeds um, as a source of um, nutrients in order to kind of survive. So C. elegans essentially eats bacteria um, to kind of survive. And C. elegans are kind of a desirable organism to study the effect of deficiency due to having many genes and molecular pathways that are kind of conserved um, with humans. In addition to the fact that they have such a short life cycle and developmental life cycle, so it's kind of easy to study. So how are we essentially going to quantify um, the impact of vitamin B6 um, on host physiology? First of all, we decided to kind of create a B6 deficient um, E. coli mutant strain, um, strain. So as you see here, there's a circle which crosses the de novo independent DXP independent pathway. This is because um, E. coli have actually lost this pathway um, through ancestry lineage. So they didn't actually possess this pathway. Um, so we basically um, kind of essentially knocked out um, pyridoxal um, 5-phosphate synthesis enzyme because this is the main enzyme that kind of synthesizes the main um, active metabolite of vitamin B6 um, through the de novo pathway here. Um, whereas we decided to also knock down um, pyridoxal kinase 1 which is a main enzyme that kind of um, synthesizes um, PLP um, through the salvage pathway. So essentially we created a double mutant of E. coli to kind of see how it basically affects vitamin B6 or the host or the bacteria um, in general. So um, in doing this we basically wanted to see um, whether this kind of affects the abundance of the uh, main active metabolite PLP and you can see the wild type, you have a very high amount of PLP, and the mutant strains, you have almost non-existent um, PLP. So essentially, the mutants that we created using P1 phage transduction essentially worked. Um, so in general, we aim to kind of see how this impact of vitamin B6 kind of has on the bacteria first by conducting a bacterial um, growth assay. Um, and we did this using various 
all different kinds of E. coli background strains. So E. coli K12, like the MG1655, which was our control because it's actually the purest um, E. coli strain. And then we use an E. coli B here, E. coli C and E. coli W strain. And we basically conducted the bacterial growth assay to see what impact this has on um, the bacterial growth and also maybe um, potentially the physiology of the bacteria. Then we wanted to conduct um, kind of um, or assess how vitamin B6 has, um, what effect vitamin B6 deficiency has on the host by conducting various um, phenotypic assays, such as the developmental assay, um, which helps to kind of quantify um, the impact of vit vitamin B6 depletion um, on the worms, um, on the standard condition um, through kind of the development. Um, then we conducted the progeny um, assay to understand how this has, what effect this has on kind of progeny production. And then we also conducted a survival kind of lifespan assay to see whether um, vitamin B6 deficiency has an impact on their lifespan. Then we also conducted um, a host microbe nutrient stream to see whether um, any metabolites or you know um, nutrients, exogenous nutrients, can have an effect on the worms in the presence and the absence of vitamin B6. Um, so we did the developmental scoring system and then we kind of mapped how these nutrients have or what impact these nutrients have on the bacteria as well as on the host as well and kind of combine them to understand a full picture um, of what these nutrients have um, or the effect these nutrients have in the presence of vitamin B6 deficiency. So, in general, um, just a, a quick over, overview of what we did. We created uh, mutant strains um, using P1 transduction, uh, P1 phase transduction and transformation um, by PCPC20, which is a plasmid. Um, and then we also looked at, um, confirmed that, um, that we've made the mutant strains. Then we did, decided to do uh, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry to see whether the mutations that we had already created actually had an effect on the abundance of vitamin B6. Then we conducted the bacterial growth assay to see whether um, these um, deficiency had an effect on the bacterial growth. And then we conducted various phenotypic assays to understand what impact these um, um, deficiency through the bacteria or microbes had on host physiology in general. Then we conducted a nutritional nutritional screening to understand whether um, other nutrients or metabolites can kind of rescue or kind of diminish the phenotype further. And then we kind of did a gene expression profile using RNA-seq and fluorescent microscopy to understand um, what maybe genes or um, pathways are kind of regulating um, these effects that we see. So in conclusion and in summary, what we found out was that the impairment of vitamin B6 um, um, basically, basically um, had an effect or altered the bacterial growth and physiology in a bacterial kind of um, strain dependent manner. So K12 strain, the um, inhibition of the vitamin B6 pathway basically um, increased the lifespan of the worms. However, it redu reduced um, progeny production and slowed down the developmental rate. This same effect was also observed in the E. coli W strain, as you can see there. However, um, no major effect was found with the E. coli C and the E. coli B strain. Um, we also found out through our um, nutritional um, three-way screen that nitrogen-based metabolites kind of rescued host physiology in general and carbon-based metabolites generally impaired host development as a response to vitamin B6 deficiency. But what we found, which was very interesting, was that D-fructose synergistically impaired um, C. elegans development in response to vitamin B6 deficiency on the K um, strain and the B strain. Um, so yeah, this is kind of an overview of uh, my research project which I conducted during my master's degree. Um, so I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Hello guys. Wow, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, yes, like I said, it's such a daunting process and especially having to give an interview, well, not an interview, a presentation within the interview is always super, super, duper, duper daunting. Um, but guys, you know, I mean, it's just part of the process. It's always a nice learning curve. I feel like 
Um, with this, you just need to remember with your project and whatever you know you decide on whatever topic you decide on giving your presentation on. Just remember that you probably know probably more than the panelists about it, except you're applying for a, certainly a targeted PhD where the supervisor interviewing you is basically an expert on that you know topic that you're probably talking about. But if you're going to a general one, just remember you know more about it than they do. You have done those experiments, um, you have researched into this um, yourself and you have probably you know, had opinions of other people who are expert within those fields. So always look for help, look for guide, um, talk to maybe your supervisor about it, see whether they think that the presentation is good. Um, yeah, just talk to people, present, practice. I'm in front of people as well, um, just to get, gain yourself and give yourself that confidence. Um, because when you go, get into that situation, it's like I said, high pressured. Um, so you want to be able to at least get the best out of yourself. You want it to feel natural. Um, and the only way that it can feel natural is if you practice. Um, so like I said, practice makes perfect. Um, so just ensure that you practice and you go over what you need to say over and over again and practice the timing as well because um, that's very important because I know some of them literally will cut you short after the five minutes if you go over um, so yeah it's just so important um, for me personally I have to go over what I need to say over and over and over again um, because yeah I just feel like sometimes I do go off topic I do blab a lot so if I don't give myself that strict kind of guideline um, then I am literally going to be blabbing my way through the whole thing and go pretty much off topic. So it's so important. But guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this was very helpful. Um, yes, I'll be back with more tips, guides, tricks, everything. Um, like I said, and um, I hope this is very useful for you because I know that a lot of you really loved my interview video um, and you were wanting more, you were wanting more guide on that um, so I hope this is sufficient enough but guys if you've enjoyed this please like, comment, um, subscribe uh, to my channel and guys just you know stay blessed, dream big and keep being inspired and I will see you guys in the next video. Take care, goodbye. <laughs>